and welcome to Ladies of Another View. I'm back and I'm here today with Carmen and Amy and I'm Patty. Uh, welcome to the show. Boy, do we have an exciting show for you today. Uh, some of you, did you, did either of you watch Tiger King when it was on? My I, husband. I watched half of one episode. I will admit to okay. that. Half of one episode. Some of my kids, my kids are adults and I did watch quite a few episodes. And um, if you watched, there's no way you don't know who Carol Baskin is. And she is going forward with a lot of exciting projects. And we have her on the show today. So let me welcome Carol Baskin. Hey, all you cool cats and kittens. Oh, <laughs> thanks. I wanted to hear that. I love it. <laughs> um, thank you for coming on to the show. You know, My Carol, pleasure. people know you because of Tiger King. And we learned, one thing I learned about is that it is crazy. The cat world is dangerous, treacherous, um, abusive to the cats. How did you get involved to begin with? I had always wanted to save domestic cats and kittens from being killed in shelters due to overpopulation. But when I was 17, I discovered that when a bobcat gets hit by a car, the vet can fix them up in 30 minutes or so, but then it takes months of rehab before they can be set free. And so they would ask me, since I knew I loved cats, if I would do that rehab work, and I did. And so from the time that I was 17 until I was in my early 30s, I was doing rehab work on the side. I was you know, building a real estate business and doing all other, uh, other kinds of work. But um, when I was in my 30s, my husband and I were at an auction buying llamas because we were in real estate. And the guy next to me was bidding on a cat and a bobcat. And I leaned over and I said, when that cat grows up, she's going to tear your face off. And he said, I'm a taxidermist. I'm just going to club her in the head in the parking lot and make a den decoration out of her. So I started crying and my husband started bidding and we probably paid more for that bobcat than anybody's ever paid for a bobcat, but she was not going to be killed in the parking lot. And that led us down this journey of rescuing all of the cats out of all of the fur farms in the United States. And then people started calling and saying, would you take my lion? Would you take my tiger? And I thought you know, first of all, what are people doing with lions and tigers in the backyard? But naively, I stupidly thought that I could fix that. And I thought surely there could be a law against this, or we can make a law against this. And now we've been struggling to get that law passed for 20 years. But I think this is going to be the year. So we will finally put an end to the cub handling and the private ownership, which is causing so much abuse. It sounds like from what you're saying, it's quite, it's, it's an industry in our country having these these big cat farms um, do you know approximately how many are there and and how many cats are they housing do you have those those figures or not that's the problem the private ownership of these cats is not regulated by anyone and so usda did a count of just tigers in 2005 and found that there were about 5,000 tigers now if you consider the fact there's only about 200 legitimate you know big zoos in America, most zoos have two cats, so you're looking at 400 cats, maybe at the most 800 cats, not 5,000 cats. And in 2011, when we started trying to pass this bill to ban cub petting and private ownership, we had to figure out how big is that problem. And so what we did was stripes of a tiger are just like our fingerprints. They're unique. And so we would look at gazillions of pictures online of people petting cubs to try and determine how many of those were ending up in the trade. And we estimated about 200 a year. So if you had 5,000 tigers back in 2004 and they were producing over 200 a year and nobody even knew how many were in private ownership, those 5,000 were just in USDA facilities. You're talking thousands upon thousands of big cats that are languishing in backyards and basements across America. Mm, wow. So Carol, I just, you know, I want to touch briefly, I guess, the tiger in the room uh, instead of the elephant in the room is your national rise to fame. The, the snippet that the nation found out your name was due to the Netflix series. It was a nefarious, ugly series that maybe wasn't in the best light. Um, thus, I made it through half an episode. Um, what, what, is, what, is, what did they get wrong? And what do you want our viewers to know about you, about what you're fighting for, and your, because you have such a background 
that I don't think a lot of people really understand. Your passion is far bigger than that series. Yeah, unfortunately, people saw Tiger King and they thought they knew who I was. And they absolutely got no idea of who I was from Tiger King. And it, it really doesn't matter what people think about me. The big missed opportunity in Tiger King was the plight of the tiger. They were almost an afterthought, it seemed, in that show. And they were the ones for five years we worked with the producers to try and get the message out there that we're going to lose the tiger in the next five years if we don't stop this cub petting. Because the cub petting is creating a legal smoke screen for illegal activities like poaching, which are causing the extinction of the tiger. So the most important thing for me, for people to learn from this, is that all of this cub petting and places where you can go to see a cub on display, all of those things are actually causing the extinction of these pets. And I Don't had no idea. There all of a sudden. <laughs> I had no idea. We were at the mall once, and they had a, a kitten liger and a tiger kitten, and you could get your kids and take their pictures, and my kids were so happy. And now I look back and realize, well, this was part of this whole industry of just using, using and abusing these cats.